He's my all and all. God is my today.
is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He'll never ever come short of his word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way, and keep my life clean. Scripture reading will be taken from 2 Chronicles 34. And there are three passages we'll be reading from chapter 34, verses 1 through 4, 8 through 11, and 14 through 21. So 2 Chronicles 34, three passages beginning with verse 1. A few more seconds until everyone has found it, then I'll begin. Verse 1 of Second Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Moving down to verse 11, to verse 8 through 11. In the 18th year of Josiah's reign to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, son of Azalean, and Maasiah, the ruler of the city, with Joah, son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They went to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money that had been brought into the temple of God, which the Levites, who were the gatekeepers, had collected from the people of Manasseh, Ephraim, and the entire remnant of Israel, and from all the people of Judah and Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then they entrusted it to the men appointed to supervise the work of the Lord's temple. These men paid the workers who repaired and restored the temple. They also gave money to the carpenters and builders to purchase dressed stone, and timber for joists and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. Moving down to verse 14 through 21. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. 
Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the Lord in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah, Ahakim, king of Sha son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the remnant in Israel and Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. Thank God for blessing the public reading of his word. Let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all the music. Thank you for what you mean to us. Indeed, blessed God, you are our all in all. And now as we hold your word, please make it come alive in the heart of each hearer. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. And I suspect I heard somebody's phone. Don't be embarrassed. Just, just put it on mute if you would mind as we get started. You know, a preacher got, somebody gave a preacher a horse as a gift. And this preacher, he was determined his horse was going to be different. Uh, so he was going to have a Christian horse. So instead of the usual instructions, he taught his horse uh, that whenever he said, praise the Lord, he should run. And to stop, he would say, hallelujah. So, of course, they practiced it after a while. The, the horse got it down. Praise the Lord. The horse started moving. And whenever they said, hallelujah, the horse stopped. The preacher went away. And now that the horse was trained, he went on a preaching tour. And he came back home. And he saw his horse. And he, uh, he didn't even take time to take off his suit. He jumped on his horse. And he was so thankful to be on his horse. He said, praise the Lord. And the horse took off and he started running and soon the, 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 the preacher got a little bit concerned because they were approaching a cliff and he knew uh, uh, what was on the other side of the cliff it would be total destruction uh, so the preacher he was trying to stop the horse but somehow he couldn't remember what was the what was the, the word to stop the horse and he, he said whoa whoa that was it he, he said amen that was the right word he, he said I love you Jesus that was the right word and just in the nick of the time and nick of time just as the horse was on the edge of the cliff he shouted hallelujah <laughs> and the horse stopped can you imagine they were right on the edge of the precipice and he was so thankful he said praise the lord I hope you're praising the Lord this morning. But you know one of the things I praise the Lord for? One of the things I praise the Lord for is that the omnipotent God has seen fit to use creatures like you and me. That the omnipotent God, the God who can do anything and everything, that this God has chosen to use vessels of clay like you and me, broken vessels to accomplish his purposes. And this morning, I want to talk to you about becoming a change agent. Because many of us are in situations that need change. Am I right about that? Some of us are, are in families that need change. Some of us are in marriages that need change. Some of us have friendships that need change. And God is asking you this morning, as you have come into his house, are you willing to become his change agent? 
Now, in one of the Peanuts cartoons, Lucy told Charlie that if she was in charge of the world, she'd change everything. Charlie asked her, where would you start? Lucy pointed the finger straight at him and said, I would start with you. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. More often than not, when we think about change and changes that need to be made, usually we think of who else needs to be changed. Oh, when we talk about change in church, somebody's always wishing that somebody else was here. Amen? No wonder they said, somebody said, the average man's idea of a good sermon is a sermon that goes over my head and hits the person behind me. <laughs> but God has you here for a reason today. Listen good, God has you here for a reason today because God wants to talk to you about some changes he would like to make in your life. He's not talking about the person who is not here. He's not talking about your spouse. He's not talking about the person beside you. He's looking at you and he's saying, I want to make some changes in your life because I want you to be one of my change agents. I want to start by giving you some things that ought to encourage us as change agents. Number one, I want to let you know that God can bring a turnaround in the darkest hour. God can bring a turnaround in the darkest hour. Let me give you some background to our text. After the death of King Solomon, some of you know that Israel was divided into two countries. The northern ten tribes retained the name Israel, and the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin formed a separate country which was called Judah. So Israel is now divided into Israel, ten tribes, and Judah, two tribes. Israel, the northern ten, had only bad kings. Every king that Israel had was a wicked king. Most of the kings of Judah were evil, but they had some good ones. And this morning, as we have read the text regarding Josiah, it is evident that Josiah was one of the good ones. In fact, Josiah was the last good king of Judah. Israel constantly rebelled against God, and so God eventually delivered them into the hands of Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians. And some of you who know your history know that the Assyrians were among the most brutal superpower in world history. And it was God's hope that Judah, seeing what he had done to Israel, that Judah would have taken note and changed their ways. But Judah continued on their sinful, evil path. Let's take a look at what was going on in Judah at the time of our text today. Turn with me. Keep your finger at 2 Chronicles chapter 34. But turn with me, if you would, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm only going to read a couple of verses there just to give you a context as to what things were like in Jeremiah, in, in, in Judah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. Here's what it says. During the reign of King Josiah, and I think it's on the board for you, the Lord said to me, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. Now remember, Israel is supposed, to be, is supposed to be God's chosen people. And God is saying, by their carrying on and, and worshiping idols, they have committed adultery. I thought that after she had done it, all this, she would return to me, but she did not. And her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. I gave 
faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. He's talking about how he has allowed Israel to go into captivity uh, with the Assyrians. He says, I gave her a divorce. I sent her away. But guess what? He says, yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her. She defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and with wood. He says, this is God's people. In spite of all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense. And then flip over to chapter 5, verse 1. I'll just read that one verse of chapter 5, verse 1. And God says, the Lord God, as he speaks to the, the people of Jerusalem, which is Judah, he says, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider Search all the squares if you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth. God says, if you can find one person, I will forgive the city. Can you imagine how terrible things were? That God's people had gone so far, they had strayed so far, that God is saying, listen, can you find one person? This was a dark hour in Judah. But I want you to know that God can bring around a turnaround in the darkest hour. Can you imagine this? Look, look with me at what happened. Because God, at this very, very dark hour, God was going to bring a turnaround. Are you in 2 Chronicles? If so, turn to chapter 34 and look with me at verse 33. Josiah, are you there? If you're there, say amen. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites and he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. Listen, as long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their fathers. Can you imagine that? At this dark hour, God was using this one man, Josiah, to bring a turnaround. And I want to say to you, my friend, that God wants to use you. I don't know what storm you might be facing. I don't know what the drama is in your life. But I'm here to tell you that in your darkest hour, God can bring a turnaround. And I believe in the audience this morning, there are individuals who are going through some trials and some challenges. Perhaps you're in a marriage that is on the, on the, on, on, on the, the, the it's about to fail. But I'm here to tell you that, uh, listen, I, I, I can tell you stories of people whose marriage was totally gone. Folks who were on their way to divorce court. But I want you to know some of those turned to God and he brought rest and restoration I want you to know that I can tell you of people who actually went through the divorce and God turned their hearts around and today they're living together I want you to know just a couple weeks ago you may have a son or a daughter strung out in drugs I want you to know just a couple weeks ago we received a call we received an email through a website a mother distressed because our son was on drugs and she didn't know what to do and the church held on to God and within a few weeks she wrote back to say thank you thank you thank you God is already on the job I want you to know that we're talking about a God who can bring a turn around in the darkest hour but listen he uses, he often uses people. He used Josiah to bring this turnaround and he wants to use you. Will you let him? God can bring a turnaround. But number two, this ought to encourage me. 
family background need not limit our impact for God. Now, some of you don't know Josiah's story. So can we talk? L let me tell you, Josiah's granddad was a king by the name of Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in Judah's history. You won't believe me, so flip the page back to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Let me just tell you his story, because you're not going to believe me if I just tell you. So here it is. In 2 Chronicles 33, the Bible says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned for 45 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. Now you can see he is into idol worship to the max. He bowed down, the Bible says, to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. He built altars. Come on, guess where he's building now? He's building all altars to idols in God's temple. What a bold-faced king. He is gone into the temple of the living God and he's erecting altars to worship his idols in God's temple. But verse 5. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. Listen. He sacrificed his own children in the fire. <laughs> Can you imagine? You're sacrificing. He's wanting to offer, offer some sacrifice. Listen, you're the king to offer somebody else's children. He's offering his own children to these idols. The Bible says he practiced sorcery, divination, witchcraft, consulted mediums, spiritists. <laughs> Let's, I, I think I've said enough. You got the picture. This was one Wicked guy. I don't think men, you know, some of you, some of us come from some tough families. I don't think any of us have a, your granddad was any worse. Amen? But something dramatic, before I move on, I don't want to miss this, because something dramatic happened in this wicked man's life. This man was as wicked as wicked can be, but don't miss verse 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria. So here comes Assyria again. Who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God. And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Oh, I tell you, your arms are just too short to box with God. No matter how big or bad you think you are, God can bring you down in one moment. God brought this man down and he sought the favor of the God of his fathers. But, 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 but you may say, Brother Brian, I'm sure God did not answer him because he was just too wicked to save. But look what the Bible says. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Whoa. What an amazing God we have. What, what an amazing God of grace. That no matter how bad we are. I might be speaking to somebody this morning and you've come into God's house and you're, you're feeling heavily burdened by sin. Because make no mistake, sin carries guilt. And you may have a sense of guilt that you're not right before God. I just want you to know it doesn't matter how good or how bad you've been. Oh, it could be you have done some stuff and nobody knows about it. But I'm here to tell you, the God who saved Manasseh is the same God who is willing to save you. He's willing to change you. 
Manasseh changed, but sadly, he had already set a bad example for his son Ammon. And Ammon became the next king. And Ammon decided to be a wicked king because all, the, the, and all his foundational years, he only knew an evil dad. And so he now becomes evil. Eventually, he was assassinated. King Ammon was assassinated when Josiah was only eight years old. And so Josiah steps into this terrible family legacy. But Josiah decided he was not going to go down that road. Amen. I ain't going down that road. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verse 2 tells us that Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father. Who? No, no, didn't I just tell you that his father's name was Ammon? David, this Josiah says, you know, I ain't going to follow this man. And so he looked back down his family tree for some role model that was worthwhile. And guess what? He had to look 350 years. David was dead 350 years. And, and so Josiah had to look down the 350 years. And he came to David and he sang, I'm going to follow him. Young person, I want to talk to some of you younger people. You don't have to allow your family history to limit your impact for God. Unless you let it. Oh, your daddy might have been a gambler. Your daddy might have been a drunk. Your daddy might have been a woman beater and a family deserter. But you don't have to follow. Young lady, every female adult in your family history may have had children out of wedlock but I'm here to tell you you don't have to go that way you can decide today that these family curses are going to stop with me because just like Josiah did Josiah was only eight years old and he decided to walk with God and he decided to find a role model worth following and I'm here to tell you young person you can make a decision today I'm not going to be like my daddy or my mommy I am going to walk with Jesus if there's nobody in your family worth following oh what a tragedy what a tragedy in our society that there are young people who are being raised in families that there is no one worthwhile following it is a tragedy but I want to tell you one of the reasons why we're operating here at GCA is by God's grace we're trying to touch our community and reach our community and bring them into an environment where they can see men and women husbands and wives walking with God and they can model people who have decided to follow Jesus young person Look at your church family and find somebody who you can hang around with. Who, you, who can show you the ways and the path of righteousness. Amen. But third thing. Listen. Age is not a determinant to our usefulness to God. The Bible says in verse number 3 of 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and I'm just going to park here in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 for the rest of the message. The Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young. This guy was only 16 years old, and he made a decision. He was going to live for God. I have a feeling that there are a lot of people here that are more than 16. Am I right? Some of you are 16, some of you are 26, 36, 46, 56, 86. I 
have you made the decision yet that you're going to live for God? Young person, God wants to fashion a masterpiece out of your life. He wants to make a masterpiece. Don't mess it up. You see, the world, Satan is determined that God should not make this masterpiece out of your life. Satan is determined to, to, to pull you all sorts of directions and get you to follow the wrong person. But God, listen, this here's what Jesus says. He says, the thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he says, I have come that you might have what? Have life and that you might have it more abundantly. God desires to give you abundant life. But Miss, 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 Miss 36, Miss 66, what, what, what's holding you back? Why you haven't come to Jesus yet? This, this guy was only 16. And he said, I'm going to go God's way. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Jesus wants to give you life and give you life that's more abundant. And this morning I'm begging you, I am urging you to get serious with God today. Come to Jesus. But listen, that's the encouragement for aid change agents. But there are some choices that change agents need to make. And this is really what I want to focus on before I bring this message to a close. Your choices matter. Your choices impact your future. Young person, older person, listen good. Your choices impact your future. People think, oh, we can do whatever we want to do. No, no, no. Choices matter. Cheryl and I were in Jamaica just two, Sunday, two weeks ago, and uh, we took a cab. <laughs> and the driver started sharing, and um, he told us, you know, he went to university. He dropped out just before graduation. And, of course, now he wished he'd hung in there. Choices matter. But that wasn't the big thing. He started telling us, he said, he said, you know, my big problem is women. He said, um, for, the, for more than 25 years, I've been making one bad choice after the other. He says, one bad choice, I made one bad selection for more than 25 years. And he said, I need help. I guess so. <laughs> if 25 years later, you still can't figure it out, brother, you really need help. So what was his solution? He says, of course, eventually he was begging us for counseling. Oh, can you give me some counseling? So we, 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 he, we, he picked us up the next day and we had a chance to talk some more. Give me some counseling! After he, after, he said, before, I, before he asked me for counseling, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call my mother in Connecticut and I'm going to ask to come for a few months to Jamaica because... Oh, I think she'll be able to straighten things out. <laughs> I say, sir, you don't need your mother. You need God. Only God can help you. If at 50-something years old, you haven't figured it out yet, only God, not your mother. Choices matter. Let me look at key choices, though, that Josiah made that I don't want us to miss. Number one. Number one, listen, listen here. Choice number one that Josiah made. And we're only going to go with the text. We're only going to go with what we see here in, 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 this, in, in, in chapter 34. We could talk about a number of other things. But let's just stay here. Uh, look at, uh, we must get rid of sinful practices and temptations. In verse number three, in the eighth year of his reign, this 16-year-old began to seek the God of his fathers. In his 12th year, he began to purge Judah. He was only 20 years old, and he's now bold enough to get rid of all of these uh, things that were idol worship, 
things that would distract him. He got rid of the Asherah poles, the idols, the cast image under his direction. The word of God says that the altars of Baal were torn down. He cut to peace the incense also above them and smashed all his... Listen, he got rid of the stuff. I'm going to say to you that if we're really serious about following God wholeheartedly, there's some stuff we got to get rid of. Am I right about it? There's some stuff. You know, for some of us, we're going to have to deal with this thing called pornography. I heard on the news this week that uh, many of the hotels, and in fact, I heard that the Playboy magazine will no longer be showing naked women in their magazines. Oh, before you get too happy. <laughs> Guess why? The reason they're not showing naked women in their magazines is because people are watching naked women on the internet so much for free. They can't make any money doing it in the magazines because it's so free. That, that sort of piqued my interest. So I did some research, and I went on a website, covenanteyes.com, and they said that according to their studies, listen to good, listen good, listen good, 64% of Christian men watch pornography every month. Did you, did you hear what I just said? 60 Four percent. By the way, 15% of Christian women are also involved. Don't tell me, sir, madam, don't tell me you're really serious about following Jesus. If when folks are not listening, watching. You see, that's the danger of all these things. Josiah, young person, older person, I beg you, this will destroy your life. Oh, you said that it doesn't hurt anybody. Let me say again. This will destroy your life young man you think nobody's being hurt this will destroy your life these things are addictive and i am telling you when married these things will come back to harm you and listen this is not a message about just about pornography i'm just using this as an illustration of some of the stuff we have got to get rid of I don't know what it is in your life. What, what, what is it in your life? What is it in your life that is distracting you? Get rid of it. But secondly, oh, I know I'm going to have pro time problems if we're going to do what we can. But number two, we must have a repentant heart. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 15, the word of God says, Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And you remember from the reading in verse number 19, that when the king heard the words of the Lord, he tore his robe. Can you imagine that the Old Testament scriptures, the book of the law, was found? Did it, did it sort of strike you when the scripture was read? read? That the, the Bible was found? The Bible was lost! It was a big deal. The king is now finally hearing the book of the law being read to him. He is blown away by what God says. You know, my uh, little phrase we used to have in our bulletin once, it says, either the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. 
The Bible will keep, listen, the more you spend time in the word of God, it has a cleansing effect. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin. If you want to keep practicing sin, after a while, you don't even want to read the Bible. No wonder these people were in such a mess. The, the book of the law was lost. Let's never be satisfied with 70%. Do, do you know, sometimes as Christians, we say, well, I'm doing better than brother so-and-so. I, I, I'm doing better than sister so-and-so. Josiah, are you still with me? Josiah was living for God. But when he heard the word of God, he realized there were some areas of his life that were still off target. And the Bible says, when he heard the word of the Lord, he tore his clothes. That was his public sign of repentance. He tore his clothes because there were some areas that were out of line. Are you so sure everything is in line? Is there some stuff? The psalmist David said, search me, O God. And know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And I want to know if God puts the searchlight on your heart and in my heart. What is he going to see? Is he going to see anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and pride? Oh God, don't, I don't want to go that way. I want to repent, oh God. Create in me a clean heart. Give me a clean heart. We must have a repentant heart. If we're going to be God's change agents, there's some stuff we've got to get rid of. But secondly, we must have a repentant heart. But thirdly, if we're serious about being a change agent for God, we must make worship a priority. Second Chronicles 34 verse number 8 tells us that Josiah decided Josiah decided to repair the temple. I just want you to know, you may miss this, and obviously I don't to go into all the idiosyncrasies of this, but I just want you to know that Josiah's decision to repair the temple was a big deal. Listen, 100 years, no repairs had been done on the temple. Can you imagine that? The temple, which is supposed to be such an important place of worship, for over 100 years, nobody had repaired it. None of the previous kings. And verse 11 tells us that the temple had fallen into ruin. Worship was not a priority. What a bunch. I mean, does it blow your mind that this is God's people? Before you get too hard, sometimes we take a look at the church. The church, the so-called church of Jesus Christ worldwide, we're, what a mess we're in. But here we are. Listen, this bunch of God's people, the book of the law was lost, the Bible was lost, the temple was in ruin, and the Passover had taken a back seat. I won't have time to go there. You read it, 2 Chronicles 35, verse 17 to 19. 2 Chronicles 35, 17 to 19. The Passover, who needs that? But despite the bad example set for him, Josiah decided to make worship a priority. One of the verses in this Bible that every time I read it, it sort of moves me. John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 23. We're not going to look at it. But in John 4, 23, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. And he talks about the fact that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then he says this, the father seeketh such to worship him. And every time I see that, it shakes me that the almighty God is seeking for worshipers. The almighty God is seeking for worshipers. And sadly, 
sometimes he can't even find those who he has saved by his grace. We need to make public worship a priority. We, we need to make a, listen, listen good. Are you still awake? We need to make a decision. Listen. God is calling on some of you to make a decision to be in his house every week. You know, if most of us, if our fridge stopped working for a day or two, it would bother us. We, we, we wouldn't say, well, it works most of the time. Uh, am I right about that? If, if you decided not to pay your last two Pico bills, do you think it would bother Pico? So why, 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 why is it that we feel it shouldn't bother God when we choose to worship God? If I feel like coming once every two months, three months, just take what you can get, God. Just take what you can get. The people of God had put worship on the back seat. But this man, Josiah, Josiah says, I am going to worship a priority. Public worship. But we also need to make private worship a priority. Because in some of our homes, the temple is in ruin. There are times some of us used to have family devotions and personal devotions, but now with the run of the race, the rat race is so hectic, we don't have time to do that. Some of us, your mom and dad at dinner time would read the scripture, but in your home, that's, that's done. God is saying it is time to make worship a priority. And this family and friends day, God is saying it is time to rebuild his temple. But finally, we must live a consecrated life. Choice number four. So what did we say so far? Choice number one, we must get rid of some stuff. Choice number two, we must have a repentant heart. Choice number three, we must make worship a priority. If I really expect God to make me a change agent where I will be the one impacting others, these are prerequisites. But point number four, I must live a consecrated life. Second Chronicles 34 verse 29 to 31. And fear not, I'm going to land very, very soon. 29 to 31, then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Israel, the priests, all the people from the... He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. Can you imagine? The king takes the Bible, the Old Testament scripture, the law. He takes it, he reads it, and the king himself stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commandments, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. The king was making a consecration. The king, the king was saying, God, I am going to follow you with all my heart and all my soul. I am going to obey you. And today, God is calling us to consecrate our lives to him. You say, Brother Brian, what is consecration? Consecration is giving my life to God to do his will instead of my own. It means I present my body to him as a sacrifice. As I prepared, I couldn't help think what humility this must have meant. That the king, the king in front of all the people 
is saying, I am committing to following God. You know one of the challenges, do you know one of the challenges why we sometimes don't give God our lives? Do you know it's a thing called pride? Do you know some people feel, I really don't need to do that because I'm okay, I'm a good person, I've got it together. But you know, let me ask you this. If you stood before, I want you to take me seriously. I ask this question a lot. But if you died today and you stood before God and he asked you, he asked you this question. Sir, madam, why should I let you into my heaven? Stop. If you were standing before God, and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you answer? Oh, some people say, well, you know, Brother Brian, I, I would let him know that I've been a good person. I, I would let him know that I've been a very generous person. I have given to the poor. I've done a lot of good social action. I, I'm a church member. I'm a deacon. Can, can I, I don't want to disappoint you. But based on what Jesus said, if that's, if that's the best stuff you've got, if that's your best answer, Jesus is going to say, God is going to say, depart from me. I, I really didn't, don't know you. That sounds harsh. That's why he's giving you an opportunity to get to know him now. And I tell you, I'm so glad that I know that I know that God knows me. Listen, listen. He knows my name. You say, how do you know he knows your name? Because he actually wrote my name. My name in his book. Is your name in the book? Are you sure your name is in the book? This is, this is stuff you don't want to hope your, your name is in the book. I hope it is. I didn't say I hope it is. I said I know my name is in the book. Are you sure your name is in the book? Man, if you're not sure your name is in that book, you better make sure today. You said, Brother Brian, how do you think you're so special? What makes you so special that you talk about you know your name is in the book? Oh, I, I ain't special at all. But I just go by the book. That's why I love this book. John's Gospel, chapter 12, 1, verse 12. Here's what it says. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe on his name. Did you hear? As many, oh, a little nine-year-old boy, the streets of Jamaica, a nine-year-old boy, just one year older than Josiah, a nine-year-old boy, and I said to God, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in today. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, God heard my prayer. Christ saved my soul. And oh, I've lived knowing for sure that my name is written in heaven I know for sure I am part of the family of God and I want to ask you this morning do you have that assurance if not there's room at the cross for you songwriter says there's room at the cross for you 
Though millions have come, there's still room for one. I know I'm so glad that he has made me a minister of the gospel of Christ to say to a dying world, there is room. There's room. Young man, there's room. Young lady, there's room. Older person, there is room. But listen, it's going to take a decision on your part. You have got to say, Lord Jesus, I'm so glad you died for my sin. Today, I receive your life. But there are some Christians who need to do something too. As God brings the service to a close, he's not only speaking to those who are not sure of heaven, He's speaking to those of us who are sure. And he's saying, will you consecrate your life to me? If you're 100% in, you're only half in. asked how oh, come you fell out of bed so easily the little boy said I guess because I stayed too close to where I got in the problem with some Christians we have stayed too close we have not ourselves we have gotten a certificate for heaven and God is saying today I want more today I want more I want your life will you give him he wants to make you and me his change every head bowed every eye father by your spirit, speak to every heart today. To that person who needs to be saved, bring them to a moment of decision. And might they open their heart to the claims of Jesus and say yes today. Lose this opportunity. Your word tells us, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day might bring forth. Bring salvation to some home today. In Jesus' name. Amen.